My name's James Jepson, and I am the uh, a co-organizer of the Les Wing and Allies Recording Scheme. So welcome to part two of this two-part webinar series on British Isles Lace Wings and Allies Identification. So in this part, we'll be looking at identification using a microscope. So even if you don't have a microscope, this uh, will be useful for you because some of the features will help you to identify species from photographs. Uh, in this webinar, there's going to be quite a lot of information. So the takeaway from this is uh, for you to be aware of the important identification features for the different groups and species and where to find these features on the insect. Uh, so the coverage of this webinar, we'll be looking at all these species here. Uh, some of the species we won't be covering uh, because we covered those in part one. So um, the Raphidiopterans we won't be covering today and uh, Osmilidae, Mermeliantidae, uh, Hemerobiidae, uh, Drepanoptrix, Phalanoides we won't be covering. And the males of the scorpion flies and the snow flea won't be covered either. We'll be looking at the rest of uh, these species though. Okay, before we start, uh, just uh, some information about preparation of specimens. So lace wings and allies can be pinned or they can be preserved in alcohol. Um, if you are collecting specimens, uh, it's very important that you label your specimens with the important information, such as uh, where you found it, uh, the date you found it, uh, who collected it, who identified it, um, any information with re regards to uh, plant interactions would be useful as well. So. So it's always important to label your specimens uh, so they are useful in the future. Uh, most of the lace wings and allies can be identified without much preparation. However, some species do require to clear their abdomen and some do require dissection as well. So here's a, a quick thing on how to clear the abdomen. So um, the method I use is 10% potassium hydroxide uh, so you either detach the abdomen, or if you've got a very small insect, such as one of the coniopterigids, which is uh, pictured here, uh, you can clear the whole insect. So basically, you put your insect bit into a test tube with about five millimeters depth of 10% uh, potassium hydroxide. Uh, if you want to do this quickly, you can put them in a bowl or a pan with boiling water from a kettle, and then leave it for about 30 minutes or you can leave it in the solution overnight and that works just as well. And after that time, you remove from the solution and you can wash the specimen or abdomen with water on a shallow tray under a microscope. Um, as with always using chemicals, make sure you read the instructions and warnings as well so uh, you don't end up injuring yourself. Okay, so we'll dive into the identification now. So we'll start off with the alder flies, uh, Megaloptera. So these can either be preserved pinned or in alcohol, it's entirely up to you. Uh, the wing venation and general morphology of these, as we saw in the last webinar, uh, is very similar. So if you look at the three images here, uh, we've got all the three British species of Sialidae photographed there. And as you can see, they look pretty much identical. So it is practically impossible to identify these species just from a photograph like that. So to identify these, you need to look at their genitalia and you can do this with both male and female. So here we go. So when we're looking for the genitalia, we want the very tip of the abdomen. And this is a side view of one of the males. And as you can see, you've got all these structures here. So to identify these species, uh, it's basically just a case of looking at your specimen and comparing it to uh, images uh, you can find in, for example, the uh, lice wing uh, key that Colin Plant did. So you can look at structures uh, uh, such as the what's labeled S9 here, and you can see in Sayo Salutaria, this is quite long. You can see that in the photograph there. So that's quite diagnostic for that species. And if you look at the other species, you can see that this um, feature here is of different shapes. So it's fairly easy to identify them when you find the uh, right part of the insect for the male. Uh, with the females, you can do this as well. What you want to do here is look at the underneath of the abdomen, and you're looking at this 
bit of the insect here, which is the subgenital plate. So in Sios lutaria, it's a, a complete plate with this little triangle bit in the middle. You can see that on the photograph there. In Sios uh, fulginosa, it looks a bit like a mustache. And in Sios uh, nigripes, it's kind of like split into two. So you can see here, just by looking at these images, you can identify these relatively easy um, if you are looking at the genitalia. Okay, so moving on to the lace wings now. So these again can be preserved. Uh, you can pin them or uh, keep them in alcohol. And the important diagnostic features of these is from the body morphology, the wing venation or the genitalia. So we'll start with uh, Coniopsa rigidae first. So these are the, uh, most commonly called the wax flies. Uh, these are the smallest uh, neuropterans uh, you find in the British Isles. And to preserve these, it's best to uh, put them in alcohol because they're really uh, tiny insects and very difficult to pin. It is possible to pin them, but uh, it's a lot easier just to preserve them in alcohol. Uh, one of the slightly irritating things about Coniopsa rigidae is that you need the males to be able to identify them. Uh, the females are very, very difficult to identify uh, even from their genitalia. Uh, so you need to find males. And the only way you can tell they are males is by collecting them and killing them and looking at them under the microscope. So uh, they're quite frustrating in that way. Uh, many species of Coniopter rigidae um, need to have their abdomen cleared so you can see the uh, structures for identification. Uh, there are a few um, different insects that might get confused with uh, Coniopsa rigidae, which uh, uh, you should be aware of. So of Cercopterans, uh, the white flies particularly look uh, relatively similar to Coniopsa rigidae, and aphids as well have been mistaken for uh, Coniopsa rigidae. So one good way to uh, differentiate between these is to look at the wing venation. So here's a wing of Coniopsa rigidae. And you can see it's very different from uh, Cercoptera. It's extremely different from the white fly. Um, it's superficially similar to aphids. However, Coniopter rigids never have these tubes coming out of the back of the abdomen, these cornicles, which aphids have. So you can separate those by that feature. So this is just something to be aware of. OK, so we'll start with the first genus. Uh, this is Conwensia. And the features which define this genus, the British Isles uh, species, is the two costal cross veins on the forewing in the basal third. So you can see one of them quite clearly there. The other one is a bit harder to see. And then you've got this cross vein, which is called AACV, which is present here. You can see it a bit more clearer on that side. And this cross vein uh, CCCV, which is present here. And these two cross veins are always in a line on Conwensia. Another um, obvious character for this uh, genus as well is the reduction of the hind wings into this subrectangular shape. Uh, so this is uh, quite characteristic of uh, Conwensia. So to identify the species, uh, you need to look at the male genitalia of these. So you've got the images here with these uh, features which identify the genus, so these two cross veins in a line and the reduced hind wing. But to identify the species, you need to look at the male genitalia. So again, look right at the tip of the abdomen. And for these, you want to look flat on to the end of the abdomen. And once you've cleared the abdomen, it'll look something like this. So the structures you're looking for are the paramias, which are colored in black on the images. And on the photograph, you can just about make them out here. So in Comensia pinticola, they are diverging widely as you go towards the tips. So you can see this clearly in the photograph as well. In Comensia sociformis, these are parallel and diverging slightly at the tip. Another feature to help you identify these is the process of the ectoprox, which are here. You can see those in the photograph here as well. Uh, in Comancia pinticola, these are forked. And in Comancia sociformis, these are forked, but not as dramatically as in uh, pinticola. So uh, looking at the genitalia for these two is 
relatively straightforward when you get your eye in to be able to identify these, but you do need to clear the abdomen to be able to see these structures. Uh, the next genus, uh, Coniopteryx, has these uh, features which define the genus. Uh, so you just have one of these cross veins, which is the RMCV cross vein, and the hind wings are not reduced, whereas they were reduced in Coniopteryx. In these, they're uh, more fully developed. And what you're looking for in the hind wing is this vein here, which is labeled M, and this is not forked. So this is a good uh, character to identify uh, Coniopteryx. So Coniopteryx in the British Isles has two subgenera, which you need to differentiate. Uh, there's Metaconiopteryx and Coniopteryx. So the way you differentiate these is again, you need to clear the abdomen and then look at the very tip of the abdomen and uh, looking side on, uh, you can see the internal genital structures. So if they're in a ring shape like these two at the top, then it is going to be the subgenus Metaconiopteryx. If they're not in a ring shape like the two at the bottom, then they're going to be the subgenus uh, Coniopteryx. So we'll look at the species of Metaconiopteryx first. So to identify these, again, we need to clear the abdomen, look at the tip of the abdomen. And what we're looking for is the uh, genital ring, as we saw in the previous slide, and this structure at the bottom, which is called the hypandrium. So in Coniopteryx, Metaconiopteryx, Espen Petersoni, the hypandrium is a lot larger than the genital ring at the top there. Whereas in Coniopteryx, Metaconiopteryx, Lentii, the hypandrium is roughly the same size as the genital ring at the top. So that's a way to differentiate between these two species. Also, if you look at the shape of the hypandrium from underneath, then you can see there's differences in the shape here. So this has a much deeper dip into it than uh, Lentii, and there's also some other differences as well, which you can see there. So again, it's just a case with Coniopsa rigidae to always look at the uh, genitalia. Uh, the species of the subgenus uh, Coniopteryx, uh, you need to again clear the abdomen, look at the tip of it and find this structure, which are the paramere's. So in the um, cleared abdomen, the paramere is located here. So what you want to do is have a look at these and compare it to these shapes. So if it's this shape, then it's going to be Coniopteryx, uh, Coniopteryx borealis. If it's more of a sickle shape, so you can see there, it's going to be uh, Coniopteryx pygmaea. And if it's more of a hook shape, so you can see it there, uh, it's going to be Coniopteryx tiniformis. So the next one is a bit easier to identify because this is one of the only Coniopterygid species in the British Isles that can be identified uh, just by the wing venation. Uh, so the uh, important character here is this MCCV uh, cross vein, which is located here. So if this cross vein is before the fork of M, so M's coming down here and forking here, and this cross vein is before this fork, and you've also got the features of having just one RMCV cross vein. And in the hind wings, the M vein is forked, whereas in the uh, Coniopteryx, this is just a um, straight unforked vein. So if you have all these features, uh, then it's going to be Parasemidalis uh, fusci penis. But the presence of this cross vein before the fork of M is quite diagnostic. Uh, here's the genitalia of this species, so you can check it with that if you do have a specimen. Uh, but you should be able to identify this uh, relatively easy from just the wing venation. Now the next one is Semidalis. Again, it's just got one RMCV cross vein and the M is forked in the hind wing. But if we find the MCCV cross vein, uh, this is present after the fork of M. So you've got the vein M here forking and this vein is after the fork of M. Uh, in some specimens, it can be absent as well. And yeah, so there's quite a few species of Semidalis, which we'll have a look at here. So to differentiate between these species, again, it's a case of clearing the abdomen, uh, looking at the tip and finding the paramers again. 
So Semdalis aliroidiformis uh, has this shape to the paramis, which is quite horizontal, these spikes coming off, uh, whereas uh, Pseudonanciata has, uh, again, a horizontal uh, paramid, but it's got this rather hooked shape at the end of it. So once you identify it's semidalis and clear the abdomen, the paramids are quite different. So it's fairly easy to differentiate between these by looking at the paramids. Uh, the next one, Alleropteryx juniperi. Uh, this one differs from the other species in having two RMCV cross veins in the forewing. Uh, the main differentiating uh, character for this is the vein CUP, uh, which is the vein here, is sinuous. So it's quite snake-like as it's going down to the uh, margin of the wing. So this is quite distinctive and will tell you that you have this species, Alleropteryx juniperi. Uh, one thing you need to be aware of, though, so you, is that there is a very widespread species, Alleropteryx uh, lovi, which is present in Europe. And we could potentially have this in the British Isles, but it's not yet been identified. So if you do have something uh, which you've identified as this species, it's good to check the male genitalia as well, just to make sure you don't have this other species. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, the next one, Helicoconus hertinervus. Again, you've got the two RMCV cross veins, which is shared with the uh, uh, other species. But the CUP in this one is straight. It's not got that sinuous shape that uh, the other species had. So this one also has hind wings, which are not reduced in the males. But if you do find a female, the uh, foreign hind wings are reduced, especially the hind wing is reduced to this triangular shape. So. That's something you should uh, be aware of as well with this species. Okay, so that was kind of up to rigid days. So um, they're quite a fiddly little group to uh, start identifying because they're so small and you have to clear the abdomen of most species to be able to identify them. And many of those features to identify them are quite small as well. So you need uh, quite a high powered microscope to be able to uh, start identifying those species. But once you do get the hang of it and get the practice, it do become uh, fairly easy to identify. It just takes uh, quite a bit of practice. So next we'll look at the brown lace wings, the Hemorrhoidae. So again, as with most of these uh, lace wings in ours, you can either pin them or preserve them in alcohol. It depends what your preference is. Uh, some species you may need to dissect or clear the abdomen but most of them you can just look at without having to clear the abdomen. Uh, the genitalia does often have to be looked at to observe, uh, to confirm your identity of your species as well. So here are a few key identification features uh, which are found on the wing venation. So you've got this uh, structure, which is the recurrent humeral vein. So this is the first vein in the costal area. So the costal area is this bit of the wing here. And your recurrent humeral vein is the uh, first vein you see there. So the recurrent humeral vein uh, starts and then bends back on itself. And it's got these small little branches coming off it. So that's quite an important character for differentiating between uh, some of the genera. Uh, the branch of R, which is this branch here going along here, and this has some branches coming off it. The number of branches you have off R is also quite diagnostic for some species. You've got some more cross veins, which are the RMCV cross vein, which is located here, and the MCCV cross vein, which is located here. So these are quite important for identifying some of the species in general as well. And the number of cross veins that you get in the outer third of the hind wing are also quite important as well. So first of all, we'll look at um, some of the genera which do not have a recurrent humeral vein. So remember, the recurrent humeral vein bends back on itself and has these branches coming off it. Uh, these two uh, wings here, this uh, humeral vein is forked, but it's just forked. It's not recurrent. It's not bending back with many branches coming off it. And in this wing here, you can see the humeral vein is just straight up. So there's definitely not recurrent there. Uh, so these two genera 
are split off by not having a recurrent humeral vein. Uh, so these are sectora and micromas. So we'll have a look at sectora first. So we only have one species of this in the British Isles, which is sectora diptera. Uh, it does have two forms. One has reduced hind wings. So you can see on this specimen, the hind wings are very much reduced. And there is another form which has uh, fully formed hind wings as well. Uh, so that's something to uh, uh, be aware of. Uh, however, in both of these, the forewing venation is uh, pretty much the same. So you've got this vein R, which is going along, and you have these two branches coming off. So again, in this one, vein R coming along, and you've got the first branch coming off there, and the second branch coming off there. They obviously don't have the uh, recurrent humeral vein. Uh, so that's good enough to identify uh, this particular species. Uh, Micromus, uh, you need a few more characters to identify these. Uh, so you've got three species in the British Isles. So you've got Micromus uh, variegatus, Micromus angulatus, and Micromus paganus. And you can see here that none of these have the recurrent humeral vein. Uh, you can start to identify them by looking at the number of branches of R, but you do need to be careful with this. Uh, Micromus has usually three branches, but occasionally it can have two. Uh, so you've got three in this specimen here. Uh, Angulatus seems to be consistent with having four branches of uh, R. And Paganus usually has five branches, but could have four. So you may get confused between these uh, two species if you just look at the number of branches of R. So what you need to do is have a look at the genitalia. And with these, you don't need to clear the abdomen. You can just look at the uh, specimen as it is. So here's Micromus variegatus at the top. Um, we want to look at the tip of the abdomen. And the part of the um, genitalia we want to look at is just this top bit here. So we're not bothered about the bottom bit. It's just this top bit. So in Micromus variegatus, you have this little small horizontal spike coming off it. Uh, with angulatus, this spike is, again, horizontal, but much, much longer and thinner. And with paganus, you have this rather dramatic cat claw shape to it, which uh, you can see uh, quite easily, uh, usually with the naked eye. It's, uh, it's a very dramatic structure. So these species are very easily identified by just looking at their uh, genitalia. Okay, so now the uh, hemorrhoid hemorrhoid um, lace wings, which have the recurrent humeral vein. So again, you've got the recurrent humeral vein. They're bending back on itself with lots of branches coming off. And all these genera here, Symphorobius, Megalomus, Hemorobius, and Wismalius, have this recurrent humeral vein. So we need to start splitting off these uh, genera. So one way we can do that is look at the cross veins in the hind wing, and we're looking at the outer third of the hind wing for this. So you've got your hind wing here. So if they don't have any cross veins in the outer third of the hind wing, or they have no more than four cross veins, it's going to be the uh, genus Symphorobius. If they have at least five cross veins in the outer third of the hind wing, it's going to be one of these genera here, Megalomus. Hemorobius or Westmalius. So first of all, we'll have a look at uh, Symphorobius. So we have a couple of species here which share the uh, branches of R being two. So follow R across, you have the first branch there and the second branch there. And in this species, you have the first branch there, the second branch there. So both these species have two branches of R. Um, how they differ though is Symphorobius elegans usually has a uniformly dark thorax, which you can see there. And Symphorobius pygmaeus usually has a thorax with a pale sensor, which is uh, obscured by the pin there, but uh, you can usually see it in uh, your specimens. Uh, they also differ by the patterning on the wing. Um, elegans has this marbled wing pattern, which you can see here, which is quite nice. Whereas uh, pygmaeus is generally a plain, wing without much pattern. There is some small uh, pale brown background patterns on it, but nothing as dramatic as elegans. Uh, if you look at the veins as well in elegans, they're uniformly dark, 
whereas in Pygmaeus, they have these dashes on this, so this alternating light and dark patterns on the veins. Uh, so that's usually good enough to identify these two species, but you can check the genitalia as well. You can see there are some differences between the male genitalia. Uh, some other species are Symphrobius fusescens and Pelsides. Uh, these both share the fact that they have three branches of R. So again, follow the vein R along. You can see you've got one branch, two branch, three branch, and the same is seen in Pelsides as well. Uh, the veins of both of these are uniformly dark. You never get the alternating light and dark um, stripes or dashes across the veins in these two species. Um, also, the scape and pedicel, so the bottom parts of the antennae are all the same color as the rest of the antennae. So the antennae is always the same color in these two uh, species as well. So they do differ by the fact that uh, Fusescence has this bren tinged wing uh, with pretty much clear membrane, whereas uh, Pelsides has some dark patches on the cross veins, which you can see here, here, and throughout the wing as well. It has these dark patches over the cross veins. And again, you can um, have a look at the male genitalia, but they are fairly similar. So the, the wing pattern is usually good enough to identify these two species. And there is one more Symphorobius species, Symphorobius uh, clapeleki. And again, you've got the three branches of R. You can just about make it there. So R going across and then one branch, two branch, three branch. And again, as with the other two species, all the veins are uniformly dark. There's no alternating light and dark patterns. But the uh, defining feature of this species is the scape and pedicel, which are just the bottom part of the antennae, are a pale yellow color, which is different from the rest of the antennae, which is dark. We've also got the male genitalia there to show you what it looks like. So it's basically this feature of the scape and pedicel being yellow, which can separate it from uh, the other two species of Symphorobius we saw on the previous slide. Okay, so now looking at these genera, which have at least five cross veins in the outer third of the hind wing. So this is hind wing, and there are your cross veins. So this is Megalomus, uh, Megalomus hemorobius and Westmalius. So we'll start with the Megalomus hertus, and we uh, saw this in the previous um, webinar. So it's a fairly easy species to identify. It's got this very broad costal space, has its recurrent humeral vein, which is bent around there, and it has at least five branches to R. So you've got R going along here, and this specimen actually has seven uh, branches of R. So it has at least five, but does have more. And if you look at the outer third of the hind wing, you have lots and lots of cross veins as well. So this is quite a distinct looking species, which is relatively easy to identify just based off its uh, wing formation. So the other two genera, uh, Westmalius and Hemerobius, can be differentiated by looking at the relationship of the cross vein RMCV and the fork of M. So this is in this part of the wing here. You can see M coming down here and forking, and you have RMCV here, which is after the fork of M, and it's usually quite dark in uh, this genus, which is Wesmalius. Whereas in Hemerobius, you have the fork of M here, and the RMCV cross vein is very pale and often quite difficult to see, but it is present before the fork of M. Occasionally, it could be present at the actual fork, but never passed the fork of M. So that's how you split up Wesmalis and Hemerobius. So we'll look at the species of Wesmalis first. And these two are split into uh, two subgenera. So this is Wesmalis and Comincia. So Wesmalis can be identified by having four branches of R. So you've got R there with your four branches coming off, whereas Comincia just has three branches of R. So again, R there in your three branches. And the shape of the male and female genitalia can also separate between these two subgenera as well. So the male have this very triangular shape, whereas in uh, Comincia, the males have uh, varying shapes, so they're not triangular, as you see in Wesmalius. And the female genitalia 
in West Malis has this very long process, whereas in Comincia it's more rounded and not elongate. So that's how you can differentiate between the two subgenera which you find in the British Isles. So we'll have a look at the West Malis species first. So you have West Malis uh, concinus and West Malis uh, quadrifasciatus. So you can separate these by looking at their thorax. Um, concinus has an orange brown thorax with no stripe, whereas uh, quadrifasciatus has a pale stripe. Uh, you can also look at the longitudinal veins as well. So in concinus, uh, you have these which look like dots on the longitudinal veins, so they're about 1.5 to 2 times the width of the vein they're on. Uh, whereas in quadrifasciatus, these are more streak-like, so they're much longer, so they're greater than two times the width of the vein they're on. So that's a good way to differentiate between these two. You've also got this uh, pattern on the membrane as well, which are these V-shapes, which you can see centered on the dots. And with uh, concinus, these are quite thin, and the angle of the V, so the pointy bit of the V, points towards the wing base. In quadrifasciatus, these little V-shaped patterns tend to merge into the, into each other, so they have this broad, uh, patchy appearance to them. So that's a good way, again, to differentiate between these two species. And you can also look at the uh, genitalia as well. The male genitalia is fairly similar, so a bit difficult to differentiate between them. Uh, but the female anal plates, uh, you can see there is a difference with quadrifasciatus being a lot broader than uh, concinus as well, some other st uh, structural differences as well. Uh, with the subgenus Comincia, uh, there's six species in this uh, subgenus, and you can only really identify these by genitalia. Uh, first of all, you can uh, divide them up, so you can split off these two species by looking at the thorax. So Mortonae and Balticus don't have a pale stripe on the thorax, it's just a pale orange-brown thorax, whereas all these other species have a thorax which is dark brown but has this pale stripe on the thorax. So you can start to split them off by just looking at the pattern on the thorax uh, as a start. So we'll look at Mortonae and Balticus first. Uh, so what we're looking at here, uh, on the veins, so you, again, looking at the longitudinal veins, uh, Mortonae tends to have uh, a spotted um, vein. So the longitudinal veins here appear spotted, whereas Balticus doesn't have this spotted appearance to the veins. And But if you just look at the genitalia, they're quite easy to separate. So the males, you can see Mortonae has this distinctive shape, which looks like it has a little tooth at the end, whereas Balticus has this more blunt ended shape to the male genitalia. And the female anal plates are very different as well between the two species. It should be uh, noted that Wesmelis Comintia mortini, this hasn't been recorded in the British Isles since 1898. So there's a good likelihood that this is extinct in the British Isles. So if you do find a species which you think might be Wesmelis mortini, then you definitely need to retain a, a veg specimen uh, to have it verified uh, to make sure that it actually is this species. It would be good to find out if this is still in the British Isles or not. So moving on to the other species here. So you have four species here, which you can only really identify from the male genitalia, but the male genitalia, again, is very distinct. And you can also identify from the fem female anal plates as well. Uh, but looking at the male genitalia first, uh, uh, Westmalius comincia subnebulosus has this very distinctive uh, fish hook shape to it. So that's very, very distinctive. Uh, so if you see something like that, it will be uh, this species. Uh, Nervosus has, again, it curves around and you have this like brush-like shape here. And Maladai has this very like punk hairstyle here at the end of the abdomen as well. It's quite a blunt, thick shape with, again, this brush-like structure on it and Ravis has this rather blunt ended shape to the male uh, genitalia. And you can see that the female anal plates are very different between the species as well. So these are quite easy to identify from uh, just the genitalia. Uh, so the last genus, Hemerobius. Uh, so 
just to remind you that the RMCV crossvein is pale and is before the fork of M. And this is the way you can identify this genus quite easily by the RMCV be being before the fork of M. So as you can see, there's quite a lot of species of hemorrhobius in the British Isles. So we need to start to uh, split them up. Um, one way you can do that is by looking at another crossvein, the medio cubitus crossvein, uh, labeled MCCV, and also the uh, patterns on the forewing as well. So in these two species, Natitius and um, Mycans, the MCCV is colorless. Uh, if it is dark, which occasionally it can be, the membrane around it is always clear. It's never dark on the membrane. Uh, the forewing itself has no dramatic patterns like you get with these species. So you can see the patterns here. Uh, so that splits off Natitulus and Mycans. The other species have a dark MCCV, and it's usually uh, patterned on the membrane around this vein as well. And the forewing does have these quite pretty and dramatic patterns on it. So we'll look at Natitulus and Mycans first. So again, if we look at the longitudinal veins and see whether you have uh, spots or dashes. So Hemerobus natitios has these spots. So the, these spots are about the same length as the width of the vein. So they appear like dots. Whereas in Hemerobus micans, these are much more elongated, about two times the length of the width of the vein they're on. Uh, you can also look at the hairs coming out of these dots on the vein. So in Hemerobius natitios, these um, hairs are dark on the dots, whereas in Hemerobius micans, these wing hairs are pale coming from the dots. Um, also in natitios, the MCCV is pale, but micans, it is often dark, but the membrane around it is never dark and it's always clear on either side of the um, MCCV cross vein there. Uh, so the other species have a dark MCCV cross vein, which is here, and the forewings generally all have quite a nice pattern on them. So again, there's quite a few species here. And you can divide one of these species off quite simply by looking at the uh, thorax. So whether it has a pale stripe or whether it doesn't. So Hemerobius stigma doesn't have a stripe on its thorax. And it's also got one other defining character, which is an orange colored pterostigma. So if you see these features, it's going to be hemorrhobius stigma. Uh, all the other ones have a pale stripe on the thorax. So you can look at other features to uh, start splitting off some of the species. So one is a, a simple character, which is just the color of the face. So the front of the head on hemorrhobius atrifrons is a shiny, glossy black. Uh, so that's quite distinctive for this species. Again, uh, you can check this by looking at the internal male genitalia, but this is quite a distinctive character for this species. Uh, the other species generally just have a pale, non-glossy, non-shiny brown face. Occasionally the sides of them can be quite dark, but the front of the face is usually just this non-shiny brown color. So to start to split some more species off, we can look at the basal SCR cross vein. So this is a cross vein here, and this is between the vein SC at the top and the vein R at the bottom, and it's the most basal cross vein. So in marginatus and lutescent, it is a pale or only slightly darkened at the end where it joins to vein R. Whereas in these other species, it's dark and usually black. So you can see it quite easily there being quite dark. So we'll have a look at marginatus and lutescens first. So a way to identify these is to look at the costal area. So this is the area here. In marginatus, it's got quite a wide costal area. Whereas in lutescens, the costal area is of a more normal size for uh, brown lace wings. Again, you've got your MCCV cross vein being dark here. Um, you can also look at the pattern as well. So marginatus has this very distinct pattern on the forewing, which is going along the margin here. So you can see these dark patches here. This is quite distinctive for uh, marginatus. Whereas lutescens doesn't have this uh, pattern. 
it occasionally can get some dark patterns around the basal part of the wing, but that's about it. And if you wanted to double check your specimens, you can look at the male genitalia, which are quite dramatically different between these. So marginatus has this very elongated part here, whereas lutescens has a more anvil-shaped um, genitalia there. So again, quite distinctive, but the, the wing patterning could, is a good way to identify between these two species. Okay, so next we'll look at the ones which have the dark, usually black, basal SCR cross vein. Uh, we can split this group of six species in half by looking at the shading on the hind margin of the forewing. So with striatus, contumax, and pinny, uh, the shading is uniform. So it's this uniform dark color here. Whereas in simulans, perelegans, and humulinus, uh, you start to get these little windows, which you can see here. So it's quite dark here. Then you can't really see things very clearly here. So there's a window. Then it goes dark again, and then you've got this other window here. So you start getting these windows at intervals along the hind margin with uh, these species here. But we'll look at striatus, contumax, and pinning first, which have this uniform shading. So one way to split off uh, striatus from this group is to look at the grade eight series of cross veins in the forewing. And what this means is on the forewing, you have these cross veins and they form uh, two lines going across here. And the one on the inner part is the inner grade eight series. The one on the outer part is the outer grade eight series. So all this means is just you have these lines of cross veins on the wings. So you can see here you have these cross veins going across there and cross veins going across there. So in Hemerobius uh, striatus, uh, the inner grade eight series is dark and the outer grade eight series is pale. So you can see that quite clearly on the insect here. And again, you can double check this if you want by looking at the internal male genitalia and it should look like this. Uh, with striatus, again, this is a fairly recent uh, lace wing found in the British Isles. So again, if you think you have this uh, species, it's good to retain a vetra specimen uh, to get confirmation that it's actually this species. Uh, for the other two species, contumax and pinny, the inner grade 8 series is dark and the outer grade 8 series is dark. So you can see that quite clearly there. So we'll have a look at these two species next. And again, by looking at the grade 8 series, we can separate these two species. So in contumax, uh, the inner and outer are quite close together and they are parallel. So you can see here, which is shown with the arrows, but you can see the cross veins there and the cross veins there. They're in a straight line, uh, parallel, and they're quite close together. Whereas with uh, Pinny, uh, the inner seem to go off up here and the outer seem to go off that way. So they diverge as you go towards the apex of the wing. And again, you can confirm your identity by looking at the internal male genitalia, although they're quite similar, so it is quite difficult. Uh, so just by looking at these grade eight series, it's good enough to identify these species. Uh, another note here with contumax, this species hasn't been recorded in the British Isles since 1952. So again, this is potentially extinct in Britain. So if you do think you have this species, it'd be good to uh, keep a vetch specimen for somebody to verify. Okay, and for these three species, uh, just a reminder, these have the non-uniform um, with some transparent shading on the margin of the forewing here. So you've got these little windows. So first of all, we can split off Hemerobius simulans. And by doing this, we, again, we can look at the inner grade eight series of cross veins. So this one, they're pretty much in a straight line. And if you look at Perelegans and Humulinus, you can see you've got this distinct step here. So these cross veins are not in a straight line. Uh, with simulants as well, you have smaller areas of transparency, these small windows on the shading on the hind margin. So you can see them here. They're just these little paler patches on the hind margin there. Uh, whereas on Perelegans and Humulinus, you have much larger areas of transparency on the shading of the hind margin there. 
Uh, you can also look at the wingspan as well. So in simulants, this is greater than 20 millimeters, whereas in Perelicans and Humulinus, this is less than 18 millimeters. And you can also look at the scape. So this is the bottom part of the antennae. In simulants, you have usually these dark stripes on them, which you don't get in Perelicans and Humulinus. So these features split off uh, simulants quite easily. Uh, next, we'll have a look at Perelicans and Humulinus. And the way you can identify these, again, is to look at the longitudinal veins. Uh, Perelicans has quite heavily marked longitudinal veins, quite dark as well. They've got these dashes going along them. Uh, they do have this V pattern as well, which you can make out, which is focused on these uh, dashes. And again, these are pointing towards the wing base, uh, little Vs. And the overall appearance of Perelicans is a red-brown color to the forewings. Uh, with Humulinus, you have these relatively pale forewings. The longitudinal veins are not as heavily marked as Perelicans. And any V-shaped pattern, which you can just about make out, is very pale, and it just, it just doesn't stand out. Uh, the male genitalia of Humulinus as well is quite distinct. You can see there that you can usually split these off by looking at the uh, features on the wing. Okay, so that was um, Hammurabide. So again, there's lots of information being thrown at you here. So like I said, the takeaway of this is just to uh, be aware of which features you can use to identify the different groups. And again, at the end of this, I'll make a PDF available so you can use these images to help you identify specimens which you have under the microscope as well. So don't worry about getting all the uh, detail into your head during this uh, uh, presentation because there's just quite a lot of it. Okay, so next is uh, the green lice wings. So again, you can preserve these by pinning them or putting them in alcohol. Uh, most people pin uh, the green lice wings, but again, you can preserve them however you want. And you generally identify green lace wings uh, without having to clear the abdomen or doing any dissection. A lot of the uh, features to identify these species is found on the wing venation or on the body parts, which you can see without having to uh, dissect or do anything else to the insect itself. So we'll start with uh, a bit more terminology. Uh, we have uh, these two veins, which are called the pseudomedia and the pseudocubitus. So these are often uh, abbreviated as PSM or PSC. So you'll see these in quite a few keys. So the PSM is the top vein here, and the PSC is is the bottom one there. So in most genera of uh, green lace wings, the PSM and PSC just come down from their origin here and just hit the hind margin, uh, as you can see with these images here. Uh, there is one genus, Notochrysa, where the PSM and the PSC uh, go on a bit of an adventure and go towards the wing apex. So first of all, we'll have a look at the Notochrysa species. So these were covered in detail in the uh, first webinar, so I won't go into too much detail here with uh, identifying these. Uh, quite simply, uh, Capitata doesn't have a broad pale stripe on the thorax, whereas uh, Fulviceps does. You can see it a lot clearer in the alive specimen there. And one thing which is different to the last webinar is the tarsal claw. So the tarsal claw, here is a... Uh, leg of an insect, so you've got the insect body would be up here, and then you have the coxa, femur, tibia, and tarsus, and the tarsal claws are tiny little claws at the very end of the tarsus, so basically on the feet of the insect. Uh, in Capitata, these are simple, so you've got this shape here, whereas in fulviceps, these have a tooth shape to them. So it's another way you can differentiate between these two species. And these, you really need a very, uh, well, you need a microscope to be able to see the tarsal claw. You may be able to see them with uh, quite a high powered hand lens, but with a microscope, it's quite easy to see these. Okay, so we'll have a look at the rest of the chrysopids now. So what we need to do now is have a look at these two features. 
which is the intramedial cell, which is this triangular cell here, and this cross vein here, which is the RMCV. Uh, so you're looking at the relationship of this to this cell. So is it far away or does it uh, coincide with the cell? So that's what we're looking at here. So we'll have a look at this uh, species first. This is Perim hafina gracilis, and the RMCV cross vein is at the tip of the IMC cell there. So some more um, diagnostic features of this species is we need to look at the gradate series of cross veins again. So these are these lines of cross veins going across. So the inner gradate series of cross veins usually has at least twice as many cross veins as the outer series. Uh, so you can see in this image here, we have one, two, three, four, five inner gradate series cross veins there, and the outer gradate series has two. So that's quite a diagnostic feature to uh, identify this species. Uh, the abdomen of this is also quite pointed as well for this species. Uh, so if you have these fe features, then it's going to be this particular species. Okay, so next is the Chrysoperlicania group. So we did meet these in the uh, first webinar. So this is a group which includes very similar looking species, Chrysoperlicania, Chrysoperla leucosina, and Chrysoperla uh, pallida. So you can identify this group by having the intramedial cell uh, separate from the RMCV cross vein. So the RMCV cross vein is quite a distance away from this cell. So they don't uh, touch each other at all. So the way these species have been differentiated is by looking at their song. So how they sing the song is they it's basically the vibration of the abdomen and it's used to attract a mate. So the abdomen itself doesn't strike the substrate. Uh, it kind of like shakes the leaf of the conifer needle it's uh, sat on. And this uh, sound can travel around a meter at most away. So uh, with the size of the lacewing, that's a fair distance. Uh, so you've got uh, Carnia leucosina and Pallida here, and these are the uh, visual uh, sound patterns for each of the species. You can, you can see they're quite uh, different uh, from each other. Uh, to record these, you need uh, quite a fancy setup. So this is how these authors, Henry et al, uh, managed to record these sounds. Uh, so this is quite beyond most of us. We wouldn't be able to record these. So we do have to try and see if there are some uh, morphological features that can separate these different species. Uh, so we'll start with Chrysopelicania. So one feature which this species does have is that the forewing tips are quite rounded. And at winter, uh, these um, often come into your houses to overwinter and hibernate. And Chrysopelicania, the species go from this very vivid green color to a much more pale brown color. So that could be one way to identify uh, this species. The next one, Chrysopilla leucosina, does have a much more pointed uh, wing. So you can see this part of the wing here is a lot straighter than we saw in Chrysopilla carnia. So this gives the appearance of the wing being slightly more pointed. Uh, there is also a feature which is a brown line on the membrane between the tergite and the sternite on the first or second part of the abdomen, so here. We can see this brown line quite clearly. Um, if you do see this, it's a very good uh, character to identify leucosina. However, this feature doesn't appear to be on every single sp uh, specimen of this species. So it's still quite a dicey character to identify this by. But if it's present, it's likely to be leucosina, especially if the forewings are pointed. Uh, if you have some comparative material, you can look at the hairs on the costal margin. So this is the top edge of the uh, wing. So in Leucosina, uh, the hairs are much more shorter. So you can see here compared to the width of the costal vein. So this vein here is the top edge of the wing there. In Carnia, the hairs are much longer compared to the width of that vein. 
this is very difficult to see if you just have one isolated specimen, but if you do have comparative material, then this can be a useful character to differentiate between Carnia and Leucosina. Uh, Chrysopilla pallida is the third in this group. Uh, this is a relatively newly described species. It was only described in 2002, and it was identified from its song, as we saw earlier, as well as a few morphological traits. So the abdomen has these blonde hairs on them, blonde seti. Uh, you can just about make out on this image these pale blonde hairs on the underneath the, the abdomen. On the face, it also has a a fairly distinct brown stripe on its uh, cheek there, so just under the eye, so it's quite distinctive. It is this quite brownish colour as well, which again could be confusing with uh, Chrysopilla carnia, especially the ones which are overwintering. But if you look at the uh, genitalia of Pallida and carnia, uh, you can differ differentiate between the two species relatively easy. So what you want to focus in on this slide is just this bit here, which is called labeled the chin, uh, the lip, sorry, and this bit here, which is labeled the chin. So in Pallida, the lip is quite short and the chin is quite broad. Whereas in Carnia, the lip is quite broad, quite big, and the chin is quite uh, narrow, and small there. So you can see the difference here is quite dramatic. So. You can identify the species by looking at the genitalia uh, between Pallida and Carnia. But if in doubt, uh, just simply record it as Chrysopelia Carnia group, or occasionally you'll see it listed as Chrysopelia Carnia ag. Uh, so it's quite reasonable and, again, useful if you're identifying and recording these insects just to put them down as Chrysopelia Carnia group if you're not sure at all which of these species you have. Okay, so the rest of uh, the green lacewings all share the feature of the RMCV cross vein coming into contact with the intramedial cell beneath it. So the RMCV vein basically hits the intermedial cell below it. And that's shared by all of these species here. So we'll try and split these off. So one easy way to do that is to look at the vein SC. So at the top of the wing here, you have the costa and the second vein is the SC. So if this vein is black, it's gonna be Chrysopa dorsalis. If the vein is green, it's gonna be the rest of the green lace wings. So Chrysopa dorsalis, we did see in the first webinar. So again, I won't go into too much detail about identifying it here. Uh, it has this black SC uh, longitudinal vein. Uh, the second antennal segment is also black. Uh, the head has extensive black markings with this rectangular pale patch on the head. And if you look at the tarsal claw, uh, dorsalis has a very simple tarsal claw. So that's another way you can identify it as well. So next we'll try and split up some of these species here and we can start to do that by looking at the second antennal segment. So is it black or is it green? If it's black, you've got these four species. If it's green, you've got the rest. So we'll have a look at these four species first. So the first one is Chrysopapella, which again, we saw in the first webinar. So again, won't go into too much detail here. So you've got the quite a lot of black on the head and this one has a pale spot. Uh, the second antennal segment's black, as we saw before. It has this blue-green color, and the tassel claw has this tooth shape to it. So all those features identify Chrysop Chrysopapilla. Uh, Chrysopa comata, uh, you need to look at a few more different features. So again, you've got the second uh, antennal segment black, which is shared by all these four species. Uh, the tassel claw in this one is simple. Uh, it has discrete spots on its head, uh, which differs from uh, Perla, which has more black on its head. So this has discrete spots. Uh, one of the major diagnostic features of this species is by looking at the side of the thorax, you have these dark uh, sutures. So the sutures here are colored in black. So 
that easily identifies uh, Chrysopper comata. Uh, the next one is abbreviata. Again, you have discrete spots on the head as opposed to being mainly black. Again, you've got the second antennal segment being black, which is shared by all these four species. Uh, the tassel claw in this one has this tooth shape to it. So that is one way to identify this particular species. Uh, Chrysopper phylochroma, again, you've got the second black uh, antennal segment. Uh, again, discrete spots on the head. Uh, this one has tassel claws, which is simple, and the side of the thorax of this one is green. So if you have all these features, it's going to be Chrysopper phylochroma. Okay, so next we'll look at the species which have the second antennal segment being green. And to split three of these off, we look between the antennae and what we're looking for is a black spot being present. And Petrochrysa ventralis, Prasina, and Palin, the Chrysopper palans, all have a black spot between the antennae. Uh, so here's a Petrochrysa ventralis, and you can see the black spot there. Uh, this one used to be called uh, Dicochrysa ventralis, but the name has recently changed. So in older keys, you may see this name. So that's something to be aware of. So you have the bite spot between the antennae, and the easy way to identify this species is to look under the abdomen. So if under the abdomen you have this glossy black surface, then you've got a Petrochrysa ventralis. So that's relatively easy to identify. And the next one is Pertochrysa prasina. And again, this used to be known as Dicochrysa prasina in uh, some of the older uh, keys, you'll see this name still. Again, you've got the black spot between the antennae and what you're looking at here are a few other characters. So uh, we'll look at the head first. So we've got three to five spots on the head. So you have one between the antennae and they have two on either side of the face. Uh, occasionally on some specimens, this, these two spots here may fuse together. So it looks like you have three spots, hence why you have three to five spots on the head. Uh, you've got the palps at the front, which are part of the mouth parts of the insect. And in uh, Pertochrysa prasina, the palps are ringed with black. So you can just about see on this image here that you have the palps being ringed black. In some dried specimens, these uh, appear to be entirely black as well. So that's something to be aware of. And then another feature of this species is if you look at the base of the costa, so this vein here, top of the wing is the costa, coming down to the very base, you can see these black spots. And this, along with the other features, tell you that you have a Pertochrysa prasina. Uh, the next one is Chrysopper palans. Again, you've got the black spot between the antennae. Uh, the palps on this one are green, so you can see quite clearly there the palps are green or a browny green color. They're never black though, whereas in the other species they were black. This one, they're never black. And this species has seven spots on its head. So it's got the spots between the antennae, two spots in front of the antennae, and then two on either side of the face there. Uh, the pastel costal cross vein is green, whereas in Prasina, the basal costal cross vein was dark. So that's uh, something to note. And yes, so if you have all those features, then you have Chrysopper palans. So the next uh, lot of uh, Chrysopids have no spots between the antennae. So you've got the antennae here and no spots between them. So to start to differentiate between these species, uh, we can split one off straight away by looking at the antennal scape. So this is just the bottom part of the antennae. So with this species here, Nineta vitata, the scape is twice as long as wide. So this is a very easy character to see uh, without a microscope, you can see quite clearly. And we saw the species in the first uh, webinar as well. So uh, the main way to identify this species is by these very long elongate scapes. So that's one way to identify that straight away. All the other species though have a more or less square uh, scape, or it may be slightly longer than wide, but never. Uh, more than twice as long as wide as Vitata. 
So we'll have a look at these species next. And we can split them by looking at the wing length as well as the costal margin. So the costal margin is this top part of the wing here. So if the costal margin is straight and the forewing is less than 16 millimeters and it is never concave, then you've got these four species. If on the other hand, the uh, costal margin is either concave or straight. So this is an example of a concave costal margin here. So it's much wider here, going a lot thinner down here. And the forewing is greater than 16 millimeter, then you've got these three species here. So first of all, we'll look at these four species. Uh, we can split them in half by looking at the color of the basal costal cross vein, as well as the SCR cross vein. So the basal costal cross vein is pale, and the SCR cross vein is dark in Cunctochrysa albolineata and Chrysopidia ciliata. Whereas in these other two species, the basal costal cross vein is dark, and the SCR cross vein is usually pale, but sometimes it can be dark. But the basal costal cross vein is always dark for these and the basal costal cross vein is always pale for these. So we'll have a look at uh, Cuncto chryso alba lineata and Chrysopidia ciliata first. So this is uh, ciliata. So you have the square scape and the basal costal cross vein is pale and the SCR cross vein is dark. So some other features to identify this species, the palps are a pale color, so they're not dark. Uh, it doesn't have a pale thoracic stripe, so it's just got a green, solid green body. And some features we'll be looking at here and in a few other species is the hairs on the veins of the uh, costa and the costal area. So this is uh, this part of the wing here. So around the middle part of the wing here. So we're looking at the costa, which is the top part of the wing and the little costal veinlets in the costal area. So the hairs on the costa are about seven or eight times as long as the width of the costa to the vein, whereas the hairs on the costal cross veins, which are these things here, are often longer than half the width of the cell here. And they, in this species, pointing in both directions. And occasionally they can overlap as well. So with these features and the other features uh, on the screen here, you can identify Chrysopidia ciliata. Uh, Cunctochryso albo lineata, uh, again, you've got the square scape and the basal costal cross vein is pale and the SCR cross vein is dark. Uh, the palps here are dark on the outer face, whereas they were pale in the other species. So you can just see the darkness on the outer side of the palps there. Uh, the th Thorax usually has a stripe going down it. You can just about make out the pale stripe going down the body there. And looking at this part of the wing again, which again is about the mid part of the wing there. So you have the costa and the costal cross veins. So the hair so on the costa are about two or three times as long as the width of the costal vein that they're on. And the hairs on the costal veins point towards the wingtip. So the wingtip is in this direction. You can see the hairs pointing that way. And they're around one third the length of this cell here. So that identifies Cunctochryso albo lineata. Uh, so the next two have the basal costal cross vein dark and the SCR cross vein usually being pale, but it can be dark as well. So we look at Sepertochrysa flavifrons, and again, in the older literature, you may see it labeled as Dicochrysa flavifrons. So you've got the square scape, and here you have the dark basal uh, costal cross vein and the pale SCRCV cross vein there. Uh, some other features are if we look at the heads of this insect, uh, the palps are ringed black, so you've got these black shapes to the palps there, and you have red-brown spots on the side of the face, which are don't have a really distinct edge to them. They're quite uh, blobby in their appearance. Again, we can have a look at this area of the wing and the hairs are five or six times as long as the costal vein. And they tend to dip 45 degrees towards the wingtip. So the wingtip is in that direction. 
at the hairs on the costal cross veins, which are these veins going across here, uh, do not quite reach halfway on the cell they are next to. And again, most of these point towards the wingtip. Uh, the, this insect as well doesn't have a stripe going down its thorax, which is uh, another diagnostic feature of this. Uh, the next one, Cuntochrysa cosmia. Uh, this has a dark basal cross vein here. However, the SCR V cross vein is also dark in this species, but the fact it has a dark basal cross vein uh, is the way to identify this. Um, other things, it's still got the square scape and some identification things on this. It does have a pale stripe on the thorax. You can just about make out there. Uh, the palps are pale on the inner face, so they're not dark. Uh, it does have some black markings on the face, and these are well-defined, whereas in the other species, they're a bit more blobby. Uh, it doesn't have any dark spots on the base of the costa, and the hairs on the costa are around two or three times as long as the vein they're on there. And the hairs on the costal cross veins, which these veins are roughly about a third of the length of the cell they are next to. So all these features identify Cuntochrysa cosmia. Okay, so the, for the last uh, few species of Chrysopidae, uh, we have concave or straight wing margin, and the forewing is either 60 millimeters or greater. And we've got these three species, which are all in the genus Nymeter. So we can split off nine to flava straight away because this is the only one which has this concave uh, costal margin. So you can see here, it's very narrow, the costal area here it gets wider there. And it's got this concave costal margin to it. Uh, some other features are that it has um, the costal cross veins are pale and it's also got the square scape there, but it's really this distinct shape of the costal margin which identifies nine to flava. Uh, the other uh, two species just have a straight costal margin. So we've got Nanita pallida here, which again has a square scape and has a straight costal margin. Uh, the costal cross veins here are green. And an important character to identify this is that the pseudomedia, this vein here, is black. So it's very dark compared to the other veins. Uh, it also has a pale stripe on the thorax. And flanking this pale stripe is a red-brown bands on either side. So again, this is quite distinctive for Nineta pallida. Uh, Nineta impunctata has a few more features to look at. So again, you've got this straight costal margin and uh, your pseudomedia vein is green, whereas in uh, the other species, it was black. Uh, if you have a look at the grade eight series of cross veins here, so the inner series, this tends to converge with this vein here, which is called RS. So they converge towards the wing tips. So that's quite diagnostic. Uh, you have some dark cross veins, whereas in the other species, they were green. Uh, the thorax is green and yellow color, and it's never has a red brown color, which the other species had. Uh, the hairs on the basal fifth of the costa, so this bit here, are black short and stout, and they're just longer than the width of the costa, which is a vein underneath. Uh, so this species is quite rare in the British Isles. We only have one record, which was from 1996. So again, if you think you have this species, uh, it's worth retaining a voucher specimen to have someone to uh, verify that it is actually this species. Okay, so that was uh, Chrysopidae. So as with the Hemorrhoidae and Coniopterigidae, there is a lot of information there. So I just want to make you aware of these different features which you can use to identify these species. And um, uh, yes, and you can also split off different genera by certain features as well. So it's just a case of being aware of these uh, features and where they are on the insect. Uh, so next we'll have a look at Ciciridae, which are the sponge flies. Uh, we looked at how to identify these from photographs in the uh, previous webinar, uh, but you can identify them fairly easily from the uh, genitalia as well. So again, you can preserve these by pinning them or putting them in alcohol, whatever your preference is. And you can, like I said, identify these from photographs, but the genitalia is very good for identifying them as well. 
Okay, so here's the genitalia of uh, Cisiridae. So we've got the male at the top and the female here. So we're looking at the very tip of the abdomen again. And with the males, you've got these rather horn-like structures. So here's a side view of a male. And what you're looking at from the top is that Cicera nigra has these rather smooth horns at the end of the abdomen. You can see the photograph here. Uh, Cicera terminalis has more spiky, chunkier horns, whereas uh, Cicera dali has much smaller horns which have smaller spikes on them. So you can see that each of the three are quite distinct. So if you see these, it's very obvious which species you will have. Uh, females are a lot more tricky because they pretty much all look the same, but there are slight differences which could help you identify them. So here's a photograph of the female genitalia. But the males definitely are distinct and are relatively easy to identify. Okay, to finish off, we'll look at the macopteran. So these are the scorpion flies. So again, we looked at how to identify the males in the previous webinar. And you identify the males by looking at this genital capsule from the top and the calipers on that. Uh, again, you can preserve these by pinning them up at the monarchal, uh, whichever your preference is. Uh, with the females, though, um, you do need to dissect them to be able to identify the species. So you've got the female here and you want to dissect their abdomen there. So we'll have a look there. So here's a macopteran female. It's this bit where we need to uh, focus on. So here it is uh, before it's been dissected and here it is after it's been dissected. So it's a dissected part of the oviposter here, which is important for identification. So we'll have a look in the next slide at these. So as you can see, they're quite distinct shapes. So you have Panopic uh, communis here. So the arms of the genital plate here taper to a point. Uh, the apodemes, which are these gray bits here, are quite short when they come away from the genital plate and they diverge for most of their length and they're quite paddle shaped as well there. So that is quite distinctive for communis. Uh, Germanica, the arms are as long as the genital plate underneath, they come to a bit of a point as well. Uh, the apodemes themselves are quite long and narrow and they have this swelling in the middle which looks a bit like knees. So that's quite distinctive to uh, identify Germanica. And Panopa cognata, uh, the arms of the genital plate are quite blunt and they're much smaller than the genital plate themselves. Uh, the apodemes are quite long and narrow and they do diverge as you go to the wingtip, uh, to the tips of the apodeme rather. Okay, so they're quite distinct when you've, um, it is a bit fiddly to dissect these out of the female, but once you do, it's fairly easy to identify by just com uh, comparing these to these images. Okay, so that's it. Like I said, it's a lot of information that's been thrown at you, but just want to make you aware of the features which you can use to identify uh, the different groups, different species, and where to find them on the insect. Um, if you do record uh, lace wings, as I mentioned in the previous webinar, uh, we'd love to receive your records. So you can do this by either submitting the records via email to me or to Colin Plant. Uh, if you use iRecords, we'll get your records that way. And there is the British Isles and Allies uh, Recording Scheme website, which is uh, a good resource. We have information on uh, the distribution of species as well as how to identify things as well. Uh, there are some useful websites as well. So there's this website on the Neuropterida of Norway and Nordic countries, which has some excellent images which you can identify specimens from. Uh, Apple Wildlife, the licensing section there, has some excellent photographs of the genitalia as well, which will help you to identify species that way. And the Lacewing Digital Library is a great resource with uh, access to some publications as well as the worldwide fauna of Lacewings as well. Uh, so um, that's it. For, uh, that's the presentation done. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, James. <clears throat> um, that that was um, that was a lot of information. But you know, you know, yeah, I am in, in awe of, of someone who has that amount of information um, on this kind of group. And um, yeah, it, it was very impressive, and it's going to be extremely useful, I think, 
you know, for people taking away tonight, but also as a recording and people sort of stopping it at certain points if they if they've got a specimen in front of them and and to support them with um, if they're using a key or etc. So yeah, it's um, you know it's it's priceless this kind of information and this kind of help that you can have, which is just different from a book, really, isn't it? Um, when you can really take people through um, each species. So, yeah, really appreciate all the work that you've put into um, preparing for that and then and then presenting it so clearly. So thanks very much. So if it's OK, I, there's, there is a, uh, a few questions in the chat. Um, um, if you're ready for those. Um, thank you. OK, so we we had one from Ian Thurwell. Um, the abdomen of a pinned green lacewing tends to deteriorate, to deteriorate and turn black. Is this a problem or something to accept and ignore? Thank you. Um, uh, well, um, with the uh, green lacewings, uh, most of the uh, characters to identify the British species. So if you're just looking at the British fauna, uh, you can do without looking at the abdomen itself. Um, it's only really um, Chrysopper pallida and Chrys uh, pallida and Chrysopilla carnia, which you would use the uh, genitalia for on the abdomen. So it is just one of those things. It's not much of a problem uh, if you're just looking at the British uh, species. If you start to bring in some of the European ones, then uh, you would need to look at the genitalia a lot more. But for the British ones, it, yeah, it's a problem, but it's not something to worry about for identifying the different species. And yeah, you, you could preserve them in alcohol, which would uh, make them last a bit longer as well. Okay, that's, that's good to hear that, that it's not, not a major issue. Have you, have you got any follow up on that, Ian, or is that? Okay. You can unmute yourself if you like. No, I think that was, that's fine. I mean, it's, it's probably more of a, um sort of an aesthetic thing, I suppose, mm. for the British species. They just don't look very nice. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> as long as you can identify them. Um, OK, th thanks, Ian. Thanks, James. Um, OK, a question from Elaine Wright. How do you view female anal plates? I'm never sure whether to look at the top or underside of the abdomen. Um, it's uh, looking at the underside of the abdomen. So it's, well, you usually have to clear the abdomen out. So using that uh, potassium hydroxide and then look at the underneath of the abdomen, you should be able to see them uh, relatively clear without having to dissect them out. Okay, thanks. So that's really, really helpful for Elaine. Um, okay, um, yeah. You know, people saying nice things, but I don't see any other um, questions in the chat at the moment. Um, oh, uh, one from Kia Flower Dew. Great talk. Do you think lace wings are under-recorded, or are they, or are the distribu are, or are the distributions fairly well known? Um, I'd say in the British Isles, uh, they're under-recorded, and we don't really uh, know much of the distributions, really. Um, not many people record them, which is a problem. And as I showed in the previous uh, webinar with the map of the records, we have places in Ireland and in Scotland and parts of Wales, and also isolated bits around the, uh, England as well, where we don't have a lot of records at all. So I would say that we don't really know much of the distribution yet. I think the Lacewing Recording Scheme database currently has around 26, 27,000 records, which isn't many really, uh, if you compare it to other recording schemes, especially. So definitely, I think we don't know much of the distribution yet. and. Yeah, we, we just need more people to, to record things, uh, which hopefully these webinars will inspire people to do. Yeah, I guess I guess some counties will, will get more moth records in, in one year than than that 
absolutely. the whole database of, of yeah. legacy records so that sort of shows um i i wanted to ask um about two species that you thought are maybe extinct about where they where they were recorded originally you i think you mentioned wesmalius more more teeny more to know uh, tonight yes and and also um heter heterobius um contamax is it contamax uh yes um oh uh have to remember see if i've uh, got it noted down anywhere um thinking if they were just kent or something then it's not maybe yes. not so much used to to us in in the northwest to be looking at yeah. It's uh, I, I can't remember the exact places off the top of my head. Um, I think one of them may have been Scotland, but yeah, it's definitely not the northwest. So it's either yeah. uh, I'd, yeah, I'd have to double check this, but I think one was yeah. in Scotland and probably the other one down south, southern England somewhere. But yeah, off the top of my head, I'm afraid I can't. Okay. Are they in, are they in the Colin Plant Key? Uh, yes, uh, so both species are in. I think he did the key of the European species, so uh, European specimens rather. Um, but yeah, like I said, the records of these were almost well over a hundred years for one, and nineteen fifty-two yeah. for the other. So yeah, it's uh, definitely not the northwest, though. I know that. Yeah, it's, it's a long time, but I suppose anything's possible with lace wings. That things well, yeah, it's just not many, people, not many people record yeah. them, so they could be there. So yeah. hopefully they still are, but who knows? Um, okay, uh, a question from Ben Sabre. Um, I'm a zoology student. I'm pretty new to lace wings. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations for getting practice in, in ID and recording? Um, specifically for lace wings uh to, to get practice uh for identification um there's quite a few museum collections which have uh lace wings and a lot of uh, museum collections have unidentified lace wings as well so uh, wherever your local museum is you could uh, go in have a look at specimens uh it's good even looking at the already identified specimens as well to get your eye into a uh, recording from actually looking at the insect as opposed to pictures from books or whatever. So going to your local museum is a good way. Um, also just going out and collecting lace wings yourself. And then if you have a microscope, um, identifying them with your microscope, or if you're a photographer, go out, take good pictures of lace wings and um, try to identify from photographs as well. So it's a case of just getting out there and either finding the insects yourself or going to museums to um, look at the collections there. It's probably the best way to start off. That's how I uh, started off anyway, getting into lace wings. Okay, thank you, James. Um, a question from Angela. What time of year is best to look for lace wings? Uh, it depends on the species, but around from, I'd say the peak times around June, July to August. Uh, you do get some earlier, you do get some later, but around June and July is probably your peak time for getting most species. Okay, so sort of high, high summer, really. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Um, thanks very much, James. Uh, has anybody else got any questions? You Feel free to unmute yourself and, and speak your question if you would like, um, but I can't currently see any more in the chat. Okay, we all have we James exhausted you of, of all other questions or queries you might have. Last chance. Okay, fine. <laughs> we'll um we will leave it there then for this evening. Um but yeah, uh, we're we're very grateful as well to, to, to James um for allowing us to put the recording on um, our YouTube channel, so you can always come back to it and, and go through it as much as you want with a specimen in front of you, and hopefully it will be of use for years to come, uh, as well as as well as part one, which is already on the YouTube channel. If you miss that, or we need to go back and want to see that again, so thank you very much to to James, and thank you for everyone else for for coming, particularly if you've managed to do both. Um, Thursdays. 
Um, and we will see you again very soon.